Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, February 13th, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but uh, this week uh, I think you're going to see that I really mean it. we got a lot to cover, so I'm going to go get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew, which is PepsiCo, do not compensate me for this endorsement of their delicious, and I'm not sure if there's anything nutritious in here. There is that fluorescent green stuff that they're trying to outlaw. <laughs> the camera was on me. I'd make a joke. I'd say, I've been drinking it for years. And nothing's wrong with me. Um, <laughs> anyway. All right, there's a screen screen. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. There's a commercial out right now with um, Arthur C. Clarke, some of his quotes, and one of them is, uh, predictions about the future are tough or something like that. I'm going to have to Google that. I might be able to use that. Hey, do me a favor. Throw me a bone. If you read the book, you like the book. It doesn't have to be anything grand eloquent. Just say... Um, Whatever you feel, but one or two sentences is all I'm asking for. Uh, throw me a bone on, on Amazon.com. Put me up a good review, if you don't mind. Can't imagine you'd be here if you didn't like the book. Um, what are we going to talk about? Well, I don't want to spend too much time telling you what I want to talk about. I'd rather just show you, but just real quick. Smoke them if you got them. Talk about trailing stops. Uh, talk about getting in. What do you do? And this is a combination of things, but what do you do if you miss a move in a security or a sector? And then if there's anything you want me to cover uh, trading-wise, start thinking about that. Now, once we get to the slides, um, one chart at a time, if you don't mind. Uh, when you, if you want me to look at XYZ and then ABC, just put XYZ on one line, hit return, and then put in ABC. And then that way, when I'm done with this one, I can exit out and go to the next one. If you put six or seven in a row, I'll, I'll, go, I'll look at the first one, and then I may or may not be able to keep track of what other ones are on there. So you could ask about as many stocks as you want. Ideally, though, the game rule, um, game rules are stocks should be uh, trending. Question comes up quite often, so I'm going to cover it real quick about um, I beat the system on missed entries. And let's say we have an entry here at uh, let's just say ten dollars, okay, a share. And let's say the stock goes up, triggers that entry, but then comes back in, and then on the following days begins to kind of come in a little bit. So the question is, down here at 950, should I get in because I beat that entry by 50 cents? And the answer is no. The only time you would get back in is possibly above this high, and that would be a trend pivot pullback, provided it's not too close to the prior high in here. So you're still getting a little bit of that reversion to the mean move back in the direction of the trend. So if you miss a trade and it comes in, uh, consider yourself lucky. Don't try to beat the system and catch that falling knife. Just let things shake out. Hopefully you're going to be around for a long, 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 long time and you'll be able to get in on all these new positions as they present themselves. But some people look at the existing portfolio and say, Oh, Dave, you got in this gold stock at five bucks a share. Now it's at uh, four fifty. Uh, should I get in now? And the answer is no. We're going to keep that stock in the portfolio because we obsess before we get into the trade and not afterwards. We're looking for that perfect timing going in, and then we let things shake out. You don't want to come in and buy a losing trade or sell short a losing trade to begin with, just because you're going to get a better price. So that's the answer on that. If you miss a trade, if it's still set up, then go for the setup. No problem. And you might actually be getting in a little bit higher. So you're not actually going to be beating the system in that case. You're getting a little higher. But that's okay uh, if it's a, still a viable setup. Now, if something takes off, as we're going to show here, then what you do is you wait for the next time it sets up again. So if you go back to uh, late January, January 28th. This was my Landry list. I don't have the 
I guess it would have to be the longs checked off in here. But the longs are going to be stocks like this one here, which is a silver stock. This is a gold stock. Anything silver and gold related. And GDXJ was a really um, cool looking setup at this juncture because it had made this bow tie. And a lot of my clients uh, did actually go after this one. Uh, I was going after more speculative issues, but I threw this out there as an ETF made up of those speculative issues that might be able to to, um, to actually work. I'm not a huge fan of ETFs, but when you get an ETF that's got an HV of 46, that's a fairly high HV, considering the overall market is less than 20 right now. And especially when it's in something like the gold, which is doing well, and it's these gold junior shares, meaning these more speculative type of issues like this one here, uh, lower price, almost uh, penny stock, gold stocks and all. But combined together, uh, it's a slightly less risky type of trade. There's always a risk in a trade. But anyway, this was set up as just a beautiful uh, bow tie off of, um, I think, all-time lows in here. So it was a pretty good-looking trade. And also a cup and handle for those keeping score. And this is what happened. It took off. And probably, I think, on this day here in my column, and this is a pretty good representation of gold stocks. You could also use the... Um, What's the other one? NUGT is leverage, but there's another one out there. It escapes me at this at this second uh, for gold. But uh, I'm showing this one because I actually had it in my Landry list. And the question is, well, why is it too late? Well, it's too late because your setup was back here. You had your thrust higher, and you had your bow tie kind of sloppy, but still a bow tie nonetheless. So you back the chart way out. It looks a little bit better. But you had that cup and handle, the bow tie. You had everything working for you. You had the perfection here, and it triggers an entry. And it took off, and so far, so good on that one. But you don't want to chase it. Just the opposite happened earlier where it just triggered it comes keeps coming in. You don't want to buy, catch that falling knife as it continues to implode. And on the flip side of the coin, once it takes off, you don't want to buy here at the highs. In fact, the day I wrote about it in the column, the following day what happens, it begins to implode a little bit. Now, I, I hate to say implode. It just kind of does a bit of a 180 from that uh, rally up. So what you do now, though, is you wait for it to pull back or hopefully continue that trend and then pull back maybe a little bit later, I guess, for those of us who are already along, uh, and then look to play it again. So you wait for the next setup if you miss a setup. Any questions on missed setups before we go to the next uh, topic here? That went a little quicker than I thought it would. Uh, smoke them if you got them. Speaking of gold stocks, this is... Um, NG, we're going to take a look at it in the portfolio in a few minutes, along with everything else. And uh, But you can see that we've got a trigger right around here. Stop was down here somewhere. Um, stop is at an area where you know you are wrong. And in this particular case, the beauty of it is it was back towards this base. It probably was a bow tie somewhere in here, too, if memory serves. Um, so if it came all the way, if it triggered, it came all the way back into there. That's pretty, you're probably wrong. But fortunately... Because the goals look pretty good, the goals did work their way higher, and we trail a stop higher. Once you get to that initial profit target, you bump that stop up to break even. So barring overnight gaps, the worst could happen to you is you scratch out on the remainder of the shares. And it sets yourself up for a potential home run because we know if we have a stock that pulls back, we know there's a pretty good chance it might go to old its old highs or make new highs, however you want to look at that. But we don't know what's going to happen way out in the future. What did Arthur C. Clarke say? Um, predictions about the future are difficult. Okay, I'll look up that exact quote for you before next uh, show. Uh, or if somebody wants to look it up now, let me know. It's fine. So anyway, you get this initial profit target, you get up to break even, and barring overnight gaps, worst happens is you scratch out. And that's what I call the better than the poke in the eye trade, where you get this profit, and then you scratch out on the remainder. But we're not going for that scratch out type of trade and that little small gain on a swing trade, however you want to look at it. We're going for this. We're going for the big money. We're not swinging for the fence, but we're hoping that, our base hit turns into a home run. And I better shut up before I throw any other sports analogies out there and show you how little I know about sports. But anyway, this is a good example, a good recent example of um, smoke them if you got them, taking partial profits. Um, I think it was Phil. I don't know if he was in here or not, but he sent me a little presentation where somebody had done some mechanical type of testing with partial profits and without. 
and with partial profits, meaning taking partial profits, the uh, they really did a heck of a lot better. This is mechanically, but sometimes a mechanical test it can help you uh, with a discretionary method like this. And, uh, just in case somebody asks, uh, the stop, yeah, the stop was back here. That would suggest a false breakout, but it's also based on the volatility of the stock. This stock within a couple of days can move this much, and that's why that stop was down there by that much. Okay. Question for Edgy: Was it there overhead resistance around two five to two nine? We'll have to look at that one. Um, keep in mind, we'll have to look at the overall chart. In fact, let's take a look at it. Uh, keep in mind with with commodity related stocks, and that's a great question, Peter. Uh, but with commodity related stocks. You have to sometimes be a little bit more lenient, okay? So his question was, wasn't there some overhead resistance? And it was a little bit, but it wasn't a lot. There was a little bit right here. Um, by the time it triggers, you're already right here, okay? So, yeah, a little bit, but not enough to worry about. Remember, this is a gold stock. It's going to be a little choppy. Okay, this isn't the most textbook setup I've ever recommended. I think the A and V looked a little bit better. Okay, but yeah, to answer your question, absolutely. And did I see that to interview myself? Yes, but I figured eh, I might have the chance to to plow through it. You only have about a week or so of trading up here at that level, so maybe just maybe it'll be able to get through it. Now, if you got a big wad of resistance. Uh, sort of like you had between four and five, that's a little bit different story. But so what? If I could get in at two bucks and change or two and a half, let's say, 280, whatever, and it goes to five, I'm a happy camp because that's pretty much double. So that's fine uh, with me. Okay, now let me just throw up that, uh, that A and V. That doesn't sound too appealing, does it? Throwing up a chart, okay? Now, the A and V, I actually like a little bit better. It hasn't paid off just yet. But you can see there's not a whole lot of bad memories here. I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a longer-term downtrend, but there's no real area of a lot of overhead resistance where it, it prior, had a prior base. You know, maybe a little bit right here, okay? But for the most part, it went months and months and months and months and months basing, and then it finally makes that bow tie right around December or so up. And it's a bow tie coming off of all-time lows, or close enough, I think. So this suggests a major, major trend turn is in place. But yeah, you're not going to get that perfection with the, um, with the commodity-related stocks as much as you might get with some little technology stock or, or some other stock that trades more cleanly. The quote is, it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Okay, I need to write that down, and that's going to be, um, that's Arthur C. Clarke, right? Good. Or that's Yogi says that, huh? I think that's Yogi Berra says that. But uh, confirm for him if you don't mind. Okay. So yeah, good eye on that, Peter. Um, but in this particular case, because it was commodity-related, um, I went ahead. Dave, is that the 10, 20, 30 MAs for a bow tie on a daily chart? Yeah. Yeah, this is the uh, this daily chart here. Nice little bow tie there. That's the 10 simple, 20 EMA, and 30 EMA. I have it as a template in my chart. So let's say if I just want a blank chart, I hit F2, uh, and then I make a white background. That's for my um, uh, presentations. But if I just want a blank chart, there we go, with where I can still see the bars, uh, I do that. I also do that uh, blank chart. So when in doubt, take the chart out, see what's going on. And then if I want bow ties, I just hit F11, and that gives me the bow ties uh, on a fly. So that works out pretty good. So anyway, this is smoke if you got them, taking partial profits. Now, if we knew for a fact that they would keep on going, then we'd be stupid to take partial profits here. But, hey, all predictions are uh, are difficult, especially those about the future, okay? So we don't know. So this is the unknown. But we don't care, okay? And I know we care. I mean, it's hard not to be a little emotional. Just because you decide to start trading doesn't mean you don't. It doesn't mean that you no longer have a pulse. But I'm trying to become more and more ambivalent towards thing and things and more matter of fact 
And I found that my life as a trader has gotten easier and easier. It's never it never gets easy. It's always difficult. And at least for me, I always kind of go into these. Um, I don't know if you want to call it a slump. What did Yogi Bear said? He was in a slump once. He goes, "I'm not in a slump. I'm not just. I'm just not hitting well, <laughs> you know. But if I'm not trading well, if I'm going through a drawdown, um, uh, maybe I'm not quite as philosophical, and I go through those um, somewhat emotional periods, like we all do. Okay, and you're lying if you say you don't, because you do. Um, but I have found slowly through the years that. Um, I've become more, I guess the word, is the word ambivalent or more, I have to pull up visual thesaurus and see what the word I'm looking for, but more matter of fact about things. And if something works out, fantastic. If it doesn't, so what? And I move on to the next thing. And it's kind of antiseptic. And like I told um, tell one of my clients, I don't know if he's here today or not, he's busy saving lives probably, but uh, once you get it and once you start following the system, it will actually, at, at some point, it will actually become a little bit boring. Don't get me wrong. I still get excited when I see something like this and when something like this pans out. But for the most part, you're going to find once you start following a methodology, detached, that's a good way of putting it, Craig. Uh, Craig says detached is the word maybe I'm looking for. Um, yeah, becoming more and more detached. And, and early on in my career, and, and trust me, I've gone through the emotional ups and downs that we've all go through. Uh, but early on in my career, one of the books I read, it's probably a Douglas book, so I give him credit because Douglas has taught me a lot as far as trading psychology goes. So let's give him credit. Um, and it probably was his first book, but he did talk a lot about being detached. And one thing he says is it's like you want to visualize it as being in a movie and I find myself now trying to say things like oh that's interesting when I'm looking at my quote screen instead of jumping up and down or dropping f-bombs which I still do a little bit of both don't get me wrong I'm not gonna lie to you and say I don't but you do have to become a little bit more detached and see things as happening and not happening to you and then the analogy before is like okay you're watching a boxing uh, uh, fight or whatever and you're watching that fight, you're like, why didn't he just kind of, you know, duck and jab or whatever the case may be? Well, that's pretty easy. You know, it's kind of like watching the quarterback. Why didn't he do whatever? Well, that's pretty easy to do. When they, but if you were actually there and a 300-pound linebacker's coming at you, life becomes a little bit more different. Or if a, if a, if a heavyweight box is getting, he's punching you in the head, it's a lot harder. But in trading, if you could somehow – Look at your quote screen and look at your charts, look at your spreadsheets and somehow detach yourself from it. Your life becomes a lot better. And like I said quite a bit, you got to be careful not to monetize things, not to get too far off on psychology. But I was kind of thinking this morning if um, I, this, um, I don't want to say kid because he's, he's, he probably wouldn't appreciate being called a kid, but he's, he's 21 years old, I, I, think, I guess. And um, he's in college and he's got a stock project and I'm trying to I'm trying to let see if the teacher will let me get in on the competition and see if I can kick their butts but um anyway uh he was over here and he's going to be buying and selling stocks and like I told him I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader I mean the caveat there is if you've studied the markets for a considerable amount of time he's not going to have any emotions in these trades and I was trying to explain to him like let's say you lost a thousand dollars and you have a mortgage coming up that's a thousand dollars. You are going to stress out because you got to make that mortgage. Well, let's say you have an open loss of nine hundred dollars, and you got a mortgage coming up. And you, in your head, you say, "Wow, that's almost a whole mortgage payment. I better get out before things get any worse." Well, guess what? Right about that time, the market will probably turn around and go straight back up if you're long, of course. And then staying with that position would have been the thing to do. I think that's the point I'm trying to make. Is that if you become too engaged and it, it, it starts happening to you versus happening, okay? And in many cases, you're going to bail out on something. And, and my famous example, which my father still reminds me of every now and then when we get together the, around the holidays, is um, we had shorted Dell together. And uh, I think my stop was at 51. And it went to 50 and 7 eighths. Uh, immediately when it gets us by about 7 eighths, of a point. In perfect hindsight, that that's nothing for a $50 stock. 
And about when it got to about uh, 50 and 7 eighths, I said, oh, the heck with it. It's only an eighth away from the stop. Let's just cash out. So I cashed out, called my father. He cashed out. We both had small losses, 7 eighths of a point. We felt like, oh, okay. at least I felt like, oh, okay, yay, I got out a small loss. Uh, cut my losses short, right? Well, then the stock implodes over the next um, next several months and just goes down to the low single digits. And I think it was um, right around the time they were cooking the books, uh, at least one at one point. So uh, that micromanaging will kill you because you become a little bit too engaged. Had I had I gotten busy and not noticed that it was up seven eighths of a point. I would have come back, let's say, that afternoon and looked at it and noticed that, hey, I actually have a profit in this position. Oh, look at me. I'm pretty smart. So, uh, But instead, I would watch every little tick, okay, and then I micromanaged myself out of what would have been a huge trade. So you have to make that plan, and you have to trade that plan. You have to plan that trade, okay, and then plan the trade and then trade the plan. I know it's cliche. And it's easier said than done, but if you think about it, it's really not that hard if you write down where you're going to enter and enter if and only if it hits that entry. And then you have written down ahead of time your stop and you put that stop in, okay? And then if the stock begins to rally, you have a point where you're going to take partial profits and you take them if it's hit, and then you bring that stop up to break even. As long as you have a plan, following that plan, if you do follow it, it almost becomes somewhat boring. It's kind of more fun and exciting to say, ooh, I'm going to try to get the high tech. Oh, there it goes. One more tick, one more tick. Oh, no, now it's back. Now it's back down. Now it's back down. Should I sell? Should I buy? What should I do? You know, it's more fun and exciting to do all that, but in the long run, you're going to be much better off just following that plan, and it's going to get – a little bit more boring for you. And the more detached you get, the more boring it's going to get. But the bottom line, your bottom line is going to get a lot better. Okay. Now let's talk about trailing if you got them. This was one. And again, all predictions are about the future. I thought this one had the potential to at least do this, but I had no idea it was going to do this. So what did I do? Well, we had an entry here. We had a stop way down here. Now that doesn't that looks like a long ways away, but notice the size of these bars. That's only about two bars away for those of you who keep score or use ATR or something like that. So it wasn't that far away if you think about it. Plus, based on the magnitude of this move, this stock could easily retrace down to there and still actually be in an uptrend, believe it or not. Okay. And we hit additional partial profit here. And at that point we got the stop to break even. And then we started to let things open up just a little bit in here with the potential of hopefully riding out a longer-term trend. Now, we'll take a look at these in the portfolio in just one second. Lots of uh, questions are coming in. We got a little uh, detached, uh, not detached, sidetracked. Equinomous. That's, that's a word. I'll have to look that one up. E-Q-U-A-N-I-M-O-U-S. Okay. Okay, Paul says, Dave, I asked you an email about making another buy on A and V if it drops back down to five bucks. Okay, uh, that's the point I was making earlier. Is that okay? A and V, if it drops back down to five bucks, should we get in? No, because it's going the wrong way. Okay, so if you miss the initial trade back here when I recommended it, this is what you do: we'll see if it breaks out and then play the next pullback along the way. If this move is a real deal, okay, and this thing goes up five hundred percent like I think it has the potential to do, okay? Now, I mean, who knows? I mean, if, you, if you're going to if you're gonna predict, predict big, right? Okay, uh, will it do that? Who knows? But if you back the chart way out, this stock was 40 bucks a share. It's 5 bucks a share. Now, what's 40 divided by 5? Is that about 8? So I'm looking for an 800% move in this stock. That would be fantastic. I'd like to see it go back to those old highs just just not that long ago, way back at, um, right back in uh, 2012. But we don't want to try to buy in just because it's cheap now because you never know if cheap is going to become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, okay? Um, and what's the old adage? If you like it at 30, then you love it at 20, then you like it at 10, then you like it at 5, then you know, then it goes on to zero, okay? So you got to be careful uh, with that, okay? 
Uh, it's still bouncing. Now my time frame is only in the next week. Can you comment on this? Well, your time frame, yeah, you don't have a time frame because that, that's, the other, and that's the other thing I learned, too, after years of doing this. The market doesn't move in your time frame, okay? So here's a stock. Triggers, goes up a little bit, and then it just kind of dies out. Uh, LIOX, great example, recent example there, okay? Triggered, looked like a good little setup, and then what happened, it died out. Didn't do anything wrong, but didn't do anything right. It went sideways forever. Then finally, bam, jumps up about 20-something percent overnight. They won't always do that, and you will get stopped down on some of these, okay? But sticking with it is the way to go. And then you can't put a time frame. You can't say, I'm going to get out within a certain time frame because the market will not always move on your time frame, okay? So here's a great example of a trailing stop. And then we had just an example of uh, initial profit target. Now, this stock hasn't set the world on fire just yet, and it's only around this uh, initial profit target right now. Uh, this stock's looking pretty good. So far, so good on this one. Uh, it took a little dip this morning, but now it's back up. It's about right here right now. So let's take a look at what that looks like in the portfolio, okay? So let's take a look at NG. So NG, we got about a $1,000 profit. Remember, we're looking for a 1% profit on the first loaf. Good questions coming in, by the way. I'm going to get to all of them. Um, and that's just the, that's just your initial profit target. That's your swing trade. That's just in case things don't materialize. You're looking for that one percent move, okay? On a one, let's just we use a hypothetical 100k account for tracking purposes to keep it simple. And we assume going into every position that we have 100k. Now I do track I do track results based on a quarterly compound, and those are up on. Or YouTube, uh, if you if you go look at that, what would have happened following all these recommendations we talk about quite often in here, okay? But with the NG, we got a thousand in the first loaf, and then what happened? Well, as of last night, it looks a little bit better today, obviously. But as of last night, we only had six hundred eighty dollars of profits remaining, okay? And then if you go back and look at last week's chart show. We had one or two recently that we that this completely evaporated and all we had was zero left. Well, so what? If you make one percent and then scratch out, that's still that's an okay trade. You made one percent and scratched out. It's better than a poke in the eye. Okay. Um, here's the thing. It's like okay, I'm I'm going to give you a thousand dollars, or I'm going to give you nothing. Okay. I'm not going to give you anything. I got a thousand dollars in my left hand and I got nothing in my right. Would you take the $1,000? Well, yeah, of course you would, okay? So you made $1,000. So what? So so what if this one scratches out? And again, that's where you become detached. Now, the reason we hang on is because maybe, just maybe, this RLYP. Now, we got a little less than 1% on the first loaf because of where it triggered, okay? But maybe, just maybe, this will turn into a home run. And now you're up 2%. So 2% plus 1%, that's 3%. Overall, you get a few of those in the portfolio, things start to look pretty good. And if this thing continues to run, then this number becomes very, very, very impressive and very, very important. Uh, another one in here, take a look at GME. So far, so good on the second loaf. And right now, it's about 35.50. So you could add another oh, 100 and a half or so to this number here. So this number here, so far, so Good, and also we're beginning to trail that stop on this one. So the stop here now is at 43. Is that right? Yeah. So even if it stops out, you're still going to make a profit overall, boring overnight gaps, of course. Okay. And this LIOX, you got a thousand in the first loaf, and then so far not a whole lot in the second loaf, but it's better than the poke in the eye. And same for this OCIP. So. We're playing for that big move on the second loaf, but in the meantime, hopefully we're able to pick up a few pennies on the first loaf. By the first loaf, I mean the um, uh, divide the shares by two. So in this particular case, like uh, on the NG, we had 4,000 shares. You trade 2,000 shares, and then you keep 2,000 shares 
if things continue to work out after you hit the initial profit target. In this particular case, we have 2,000 shares total. You divide that by two. You have your trading loaf and your trending loaf. Write that down. Your trading loaf and your trending loaf. Okay? And hopefully that trending loaf pays off. And trust me, that's where the real money is. But I'm okay hitting a bunch of little singles. And there I go with a stupid sports analogy again. But I'm okay with a bunch of singles while waiting on the uh, big thing. Okay, question is, I wonder if I can draw on this screen. Let's see. Okay, uh, question is this. Uh, do you recommend pyramiding into position? Absolutely not. Okay. The problem with pyramiding in is I like you put on a full position, okay, because we're looking for that initial reversion to the mean move out. We're looking for this move hopefully up to the profit target. So we want to put in, put on a full position, okay? How do I represent that? Let's just say, let's just do it in shares. Let's say in this particular case, it called for 200 shares. We want to put all those 200 shares on right away. So if we get that initial move we're looking for, we're looking for that perfection in the setup. We're going to obsess before we get into a position and not afterwards. We're not going to sit here and watch it. Folks, oh, tan's up 89 cents. Oh, 88 cents. Oh, 87 cents. Oh, wait, it's up a dollar. Oh, LIOX is up 15 cents. Yay. Oh, 14 cents. Oh, boo. You know, we're not going to do that all day, okay? We're going to let things ride. We're going to let things go, good, bad, or indifferent. So you set everything up. You look for perfection from this point back, okay? And then after that point, because all predictions are about the future, you're not going to get that perfection. So we're going to put on that whole 200 with the assumption that we did our homework and this is going to work out. We're going to get this move here. Now, some people say, well, you put on, let's say you put on 100, and then if it, did, it begins to rally, then you put on another 100. Well, you start pyramiding into this position, and if this turns out to be the exact top, you're buying at these highs in here. So it's just a bad idea, and I think you can get yourself really hurt pyramiding into position. I think you're much better off doing just the opposite of pyramiding. You're much better off selling into those rallies. Linda Rasky used to say, feed the ducks while they're quacking. I emailed her on that, and she said it's just probably an old florism she picked up off the floor. So when you have a market that's looking uh, pretty good, you have a market that looks pretty good, and it's going straight up like this. You got it on, you know, on your little pullback or wherever you got in. Okay, you got in back here. And it's kind of going straight up like the goals were just the other day. Well, you feed the ducks while they're quacking. You're able to sell into that euphoria that we had two or three days ago, whenever it was, whenever the NG triggered, or I'm sorry, it hit the initial profit target. And you're able to take some money off the table. And if it corrects as it did, so what? Maybe it's just going to set up for the next leg higher. OK, um, but you're much worse off. Let's say it's like, oh, it's working out. Let me add on another 100 shares here. Well, so far, you're going to be losing on that position. So it's much be you're much better off selling into a position than you are trying to pyramid into a, a position. OK, so instead of buying at that high, you're better off selling into that high. Um, and just like I said earlier, Phil, who's in here today from um, across the pond, sent me the, that paper on uh, taking partial profits. It was actually a little webinar on partial profits. It was a pretty good uh, little webinar. And they showed that you're better off taking those partial profits as opposed to letting everything ride all of the time. Now, my where my bread and butter comes in is when we have that little solar stock that goes from five to $35 a share, okay, and really pays off. Or maybe, just maybe, this little this little $2, $3, okay, speculative, completely speculative gold stock is going to quadruple in value, okay, and then that's going to be pretty good. Let's say this one here, I mean, I don't know if it will or not, but let's say it goes up to 10 bucks a share, well, now all of a sudden, I'm going to have a $20,000 profit, maybe less a little bit, but you get the, you get the idea, okay? And we'll keep, we'll keep uh, dueling with this portfolio here and there to see what happens as things uh, shake out. The only other thing I wanted to mention, I, I mentioned this last week, so I don't want to beat the dead horse too much on this, 
But if you take a look at like some of the stocks in here, like OCIP and RLYP, which are um, so far working out. I mean, this one obviously much better than this one, but they're all doing okay, right? Um, had you exited, had you known that the 15th of January was going to be the absolute high of the market, had you exited a lot of these longs, you would have missed out on some pretty substantial moves. And as I showed last week, your portfolio would have actually been in a negative column. Okay, Jonathan asks, it says open hypothetical, hypothetical por portfolio, so these are not real positions. Some of them may be, some of them may be based on time and sales. Some of them are real positions. Um, for disclaimer purposes and to keep me out of trouble, this is a hypothetical portfolio. But I'm not going to, for instance, you'll notice that this right here entry, we were actually looking for a little bit different entry on this. And I notice that this is the full thousand dollars. So these numbers are very real numbers, okay? But it's hypothetical, okay? So I have to say hypothetical. Now it's not hypothetical in that I just made all these numbers up, okay? I actually said the day before this triggered, this is where you should get in. And I actually said this is where you should take that initial partial profit. And this is where your stop should be. Okay, so that part isn't hypothetical, but whether or not the trade was taken just to keep me out of trouble, it's a hypothetical portfolio. Okay, it's just like the screen at the front of the screen front says, I'm not a registered investment advisor. Okay, <laughs> so, so take everything with a grain of salt. But I'm pretty good sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Check back when I hit a drawdown, okay? Yeah. We'll see how uh, smug I am. Okay. Pyramiding is an appropriate way to probe a position to see if it will move in the right direction with the type of trading we are doing. The trigger is proof of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm not a big fan of pyramiding. I, if, you're, if you're a big fund manager, then maybe you have to kind of work your way into a position and work your way out of a position. Um, and that's fine. I mean, because you're forced to do that. The, the, the nimble aspect we have, and I, like I said, I think last week I'm reading David and Goliath, uh, one sitting at a time, but, uh, which is a Malcolm Gladwell book. You can get it off my front of my website, uh, through Amazon. And he does talk about some of the advantages being small and nimble has versus being a Goliath. And that's one advantage we do have as being the private retail trader is being able to go in and take some of these stocks. Some of my institutional clients, um, as I've said, probably ad nauseum, they thank me for for ferreting out a cool little solar stock, but they also tell me they can't actually take the stock. So you have that advantage as a small private trader being able to do some of these things, okay? Yeah, hang on, John. We'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, Craig's point now, too, you start pyramiding a lot. You're also going to encounter more and more fees. You're also going to encounter more and more slippage. So the more you trade, the more slippage, and some people call them frictional costs, the more frictional costs you're going to have. It's expensive to trade. And I, I know I'm a trader, and, and but it's expensive to trade. So ideally, it's a lot cheaper to ride a stock out, like every night in we'll have one, believe it or not, go a year or two in the portfolio. Not all often. Okay? There's only a few I can think of right off that have gone substantial amounts of time. But it's much cheaper. It doesn't cost you anything to sit in a stock of provider. Of course, it's, it's moving in your favor, okay, as long as it moves in your favor, obviously. And you will have to give up some of those open profits. That's life. But I've showed time and time again Stock's up 50%, comes back in, it's only up 25%, so you lost quite a bit of those open profits. But then it's up 50% 50 again, and it goes 100%. And then it comes back to, let's say, 75% open profit. Then it goes to 125, then 150 and 300. If you quit at any one of those levels, you're never going to make it to the next level, obviously. So that's why you just let things work out. Don't try to second-guess things. Don't try to... Put a lot of pressure on yourself to get things just right, um, which sort of dovetails into our next um, thing here. The pressure's off. 
and I've been talking about this on and off for a while, ever since the market began to slide, in fact, the last few weeks, almost a month now. Um, years ago, some of you guys might remember Prodigy, but I was in some of these investment uh, groups on Prodigy, and this one guy was always pumping this little pump stock, literally it was a pump stock that pumped, um, I guess it pumped medicines um, in your system or something. And it was a little cheap, speculative, kind of penny stock type of thing. And he was he would come in every day and talk about how great the stock was, blah, 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 and go on and on and on and on and on. So I started accumulating a position in it, and this is before I really knew what I was doing, obviously. And I, I got a pretty big position, especially given the size of my portfolio, and I was in my 20s, pretty young guy still. And uh, one day the stock just imploded, so I immediately starts start um, emailing this guy, and he's like, "David, no one rings a bell for us when the stock is hit." It's yeah, he got all philosophical on me. Whereas the day before he was pumping the stock, and I was buying it, but it was a very expensive lesson to learn that you're right. Nobody rings a bell for us when the market has top. Now this doesn't mean you shouldn't look for clues and if you see some short setting up like if you go back one slide into portfolio even though the market was hitting new highs this GME showed up as a possible short in here okay but you do want to look at where the market is you do want to look for clues within you do want to have an idea like I have an idea right now this market I think is still in trouble we're gonna flesh that out in just one second but you don't have to get your prediction precisely right and you surgeons out there you doctors out there you engineers out there uh, you're my worst clients because you have to get everything right in your profession or you're gonna kill people okay so you have to be precise well trading is not that precise as I said a minute ago I had a um, you know guy shows up in my office yesterday and we spent some time teaching him how to trade and teaching technical analysis and all and um, where was I going with that? <laughs> um, oh uh, yeah, I know. I know what I want to say. So I explained to him like ten seconds before he showed up, I sold some gold stock, and when teaching him the technical analysis, I said I just sold this gold stock. I sold half of my shares because. I decided that I wanted to take a profit. I hit my profit target, so I decided I want to take a profit. Now, my selling those shares has absolutely nothing to do with the overall company's earnings. They're going to keep digging gold today. They would keep digging gold the day, the two days from now. That has nothing to do with the company, and that's why technical analysis works because you're dealing with the emotions of others. And in my case. It was a calculated type of trade. It wasn't emotional at all. But let's say that I dumped enough on the market to where it knocks it down a few cents. It's kind of a cheap stock, so it could have knocked it down a few cents. Um, and then somebody else gets nervous because they've got to make that mortgage payment, so they start dumping the stock. And as I explained to this gentleman that was in my office yesterday, it's like Tom McClellan says, you're making a relationship between you and the company and you're expecting that CEO to not go shag some porn star or whatever like has happened in the past. You expected him to behave in an ethical manner and not cook the books like Dell did a while back. Okay, You expect him to do these things and the company to not kill people and, and, and be ethical, etc. But you're also forming a relationship with these other people and these other people screw you. Okay, Because they'll dump that stock. Some hedge fund gets in trouble. He's got to liquidate. Okay, and that will push that stock lower. So that has nothing to do with whether or not the company is a good company or not. Okay, so there's it's an imperfect world. It's a long-winded way of saying that's an imperfect world out there. You're dealing with the emotions of others. You're never going to get it exactly right. I know there's people out there. Oh, we got a third wave extension of a fourth wave count on the number thirteen. Blah blah blah, and. You know, eventually, maybe they'll get a um, hundred out of every one top. I don't know what's the old saying on that. They're going to be wrong a lot. So the pressure's off. You don't have to be exact in this business. 
What you do want to do is you want to look for perfection going into a setup, but once you have that setup, take it if it triggers and follow your plan. Okay, so the pressure's not off there, but the pressure's off and that you don't have to get the market timing precisely right because it's harder to predict the overall market than it is to predict the individual stocks. So doesn't mean that you have to ignore what's going on in the market. Do look at the index, but make indices. Make sure you're looking at the sectors too. And do what I do, look at a couple thousand stocks every day to get a feel for what's really going on, okay? And then, I hate to use the word bet, but make your bets accordingly. But the pressure's off. Let the market, let the ebb and flow control your portfolio. So if you start getting stopped out of positions, that's the market telling you that those positions are bad positions. Let the market take you out of those positions. I used to get really pissed off when I get stopped out on something. And again, I'm a little philosophical now because we had a pretty good run here and we've navigated this little spill, knock on wood, uh, fairly well. But I used to get very aggravated when I get stopped out. And now I'm kind of like, okay, I'm glad that stock is out of my portfolio. I'm glad I still have these big winners in here doing really well. Not that they will always be in there, but let that market prune your portfolio for you and don't try to second guess or guess every single move the market is going to make and don't try to guess every move the stock is going to make. Okay, I have no idea if NG or A and V are going to continue to run. I hope they do, but I have no idea. So the pressure's off and if you're just following the plan, it's going to take a lot of weight off of your shoulders. And don't expect someone, as a gentleman earlier said, to ring a bell when the bear market, when the bull market, I should say, has ended. Okay? Okay, we'll get to that. Good questions. Britney Spears quote. Okay. <laughs> Hit me, baby, one more time. Is that it? I am the only one who could see charts I am the only one who can't see charts we're on uh, you should see a light switch okay so um, I'm not sure what's going on could you use options to potentially compound profits or hedge positions okay well that opens up a huge can of worms okay there are some select cases where maybe you could use options and I don't want to get too far into that um, but let's just, let me just show you one thing here. Let's say, let's say you got some profits, okay? It stocks up here. So you got some profits up here. Well, you buy a put, it's going to cost you, let's say a dollar. So let's just say a hundred bucks, okay? So now the next hundred dollars just goes higher it's gonna you're gonna scratch out because you already spent a hundred dollars well guess what this put is gonna start eroding in value and now that puts only worth let's say fifty bucks okay and if this thing keeps going higher this puts gonna become worthless and it's way down here and you have no protection okay now let's say the market begins to drop well what you lose what you make back on your option you're gonna lose in the position so you net net you end up with nothing so Hedging is very, it's a farce, okay? Um, it's a very dangerous thing to do. Now, I hate to say this. This is something I tell, I've told clients before kind of in passing uh, on a private level, but I'll tell you. I mean, say you get a huge windfall in a stock. It just goes straight up. You know this thing's going to have the mother of all corrections soon, okay? So you could take a wild, crazy bet you could exit out of this thing when it's going to the moon and take a wild crazy bet and buy some out of the money options with a small amount of the proceeds with a small amount of the proceeds fritter away that money because you know that this retrace coming in is probably going to be uh, bigger than what you would lose buying those options and taking that profit but that's a very rare case and when that does happen the implies are going to be so darn high on this it might not be worth your while so I, I really should even say that but that's about the only case I could think of where you might want to trade out of a position into some options. And I'm talking like if you have a huge windfall in something, okay, you're better off probably just lightening up in a position and holding on to a piece longer term in case it continues to run. Because let's say 
it does continue to run, but it doesn't get up to where those options are and those options expire. So now what do you do? So now you've lost your position and you can't just jump in willy-nilly. So it's kind of a can of worms when you get into options. That's one. I mean, if, if you have the mother of all windfalls overnight or over a short period of time where you really doubt that it could sustain itself, then you might consider something like that. Hedging is a bad idea. Um, people say, oh, I'm hedged. It's like, eh, it's bullshit. I mean, there's no, you can't hedge. Trust me. Many people have tried, okay? Because if the market goes in your favor, your hedge is going to go down. You're going to lose money on your hedge. You're going to make money but lose money. Net, net, you got nothing, okay? Market goes down. You're going to make money on your hedge, but you lose money in position. Net, net, you got nothing, okay? So you got nothing in bad English. You don't have anything, okay? So, I mean, try it if you want and, uh, and get back to me. I think you have a hard time um, with that, okay? The compounding profit things, eh, you got to be careful with that. Like I said, sometimes you could you could fritter away if you had that really big win and you're willing to fritter, if, if you cash out and you're willing to fritter away a portion of the proceeds of some kind of wild, crazy options, knowing that there's a 99% chance they're going to expire worthless. But if something happens where that stock explodes, then, yeah, you're leveraged up and you make an absolute fortune. It becomes a lottery ticket in that particular case, but you already have a huge profit to begin with, and you're only going to fritter a small percentage of those profits away to make that kind of bet. And I do, when I say bet in this particular case, I mean it, it truly is that, just a bet, okay? Okay, Howard says, ATR of 17 cents times 4,000 shares. Try to limit losses to under 1,000. Normally give about three times ATR. That over 2%. Is that too conservative? Um, well, you lost me on that, okay? Now, I don't use ATR, but what you what you do is I, just, I keep it a lot simpler, okay? I say, okay, I look at this NG here. My entry is 280. I eyeball it, and I say, okay, it's about 280 on my entry. Uh, stop's going to be down here around, um, what was the stop on that? I forget. How much is it? 50 cents, okay. So stop is going to be down around 230, which puts me back into this base. I know I'm wrong as a trend follower there, so that works out. Nicely, so this actually needs to be a little bit lower in here. I just kind of eyeballed this this morning. Okay, for me, it's a lot easier. It, 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 in your case, you're like looking at ATRs, you're doing all this math. You, you kind of lost me on that, okay? So I'm not sure how to answer that question, but you should only put 2% of your portfolio into the position if stopped out. So the math on that comes to 4,000 shares because you're only trading a half, a, you only have a half a point at risk, okay? So that math is pretty easy. In fact, the spreadsheet, which I'll give you one similar to it, I won't give you this exact one, but I'll give you one very similar to it. Um, when I punch in my stop, which is over here, you can't see it, it's just off the screen, I put in 50 cents here. This number here is automatically calculated for me, so I know how many shares to put on, okay, based on that stop, okay. So in this case here, it's 2,000. That's probably was a one-point stop. Yeah, look, one-point stop right there. So over here, I'll have one point. So figure out where that stop needs to be. Figure out how wide you think it needs to be. If you want to use ATR, that's fine. And if you come up with a number like this number here, so you say, okay, well, I'm going to take this here, and I punch that into the spreadsheet. In this particular case, I know it sounds crazy, but it's like seven points. So you only end up buying, in that particular case, if I could find it right here, like 300 shares, okay? Round numbers, 286 shares. You just round up if you're successful or been successful, round down and, and take smaller share size if, you, if you're not uh, successful or haven't been successful, okay? So yeah, Howard, that's a hard question to answer. Uh, Two thirty, thank you, thank you, Barry, uh, on that. But just keep it simple. Figure out how much room you need to give it to survive a short-term move. 
Okay, and in that particular case, in that particular stock, it was a half a point. Sounds like a lot, but the stock bounces around quite a bit, so it's really not that much. A lot of you guys use ATR, average true range, to come to that number. That's fine, but any time you do something statistical, I find that those statistical numbers can get really out of whack really quick. I'd much rather eyeball it and say, well, we got some support down there, and then, and that would negate the breakout, and use the chart to your advantage and say, okay, what's the tightest possible stop I could put in here? It still possibly withstand a short-term move, okay? And that's the question, and the only question you need to ask yourself. You are a true moron. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. A trend-following moron, not a true moron, okay? Um, once again, a couple of random thoughts. I just left these in from last year, last year, last week and week before. Uh, take things one day at a time. Don't try to figure it all out in one day as far as market direction and market timing. I mean, I've been kind of bearish here, and I've been a little wrong lately. This market's retraced. But so far, it hasn't hurt me, knock on wood. Not that that doesn't always work out that well. But so far, it hasn't hurt me because the longs have gone up, thank goodness, and, and most of the shorts, one notwithstanding, um, have gone down. So it doesn't always work that way. Results not typical. Your results may vary, and all these other disclaimers, okay? Uh, once again, continue to play a good offense in, in 2014, and that's going to be my goal in 2014. And I was thinking about that this morning. I'm going to come in, and not that I haven't done it in prior years, but I'm going to make an incredible conscious effort to pick the best stocks in 2014, and that's my main goal in trading. I'm going to pick the best and leave the rest. And if there's nothing to do, I'm not going to do anything. So be selective and take only positions where you just can't stand it. You feel like you have to have that position. So that's my goal in 2014 and that's my plan and that's I'm going to stick to that. Try to pick the best of the best. And there was uh, an article years ago and I think Connors had worked it into his work and I know Rasky had, had talked about these type of things too. And uh, it's, it's kind of Malcolm Gladwell-ish type of thing. Malcolm Gladwell talks a lot about these things, too. And it's called deliberate practice. And if you read a lot of Malcolm Gladwell, uh, you'll kind of get, get the gist of what that is. But deliberate practice is practicing but trying to get better. So in, in my daily going through the charts, I'm trying to get better and better and better every day. So I'm deliberately working to get better and better. And that's exactly what you should do, too. Regardless of what you do, okay, become better and better every day at what you do. So be selective, control your emotions to, to, you know, I mean, obviously we still have a pulse. It's okay to get up, have ups and downs. That's fine. But try not to get too emotional and pick a less than ideal stock, okay? If the stock looks great, then take it. If it doesn't, then it doesn't. Okay, the pressure's off. Don't put all that pressure on yourself. But try to pick the best of the best stocks that work to get even better at that. Now, last week we talked about, or in prior weeks, I should say, we talked about the stocks that we picked in the stock selection webinar. And this is actually, I'll show you where this, this came straight off my website if you want to look at this uh, later. But these are the moves, and, and I show the high of the move. And almost all of these stocks uh, triggered with very little drawdown. And, and took off for the most part. Now, some of these you might not have taken. They might not have triggered like I think this one may not have triggered and this LTS may not have triggered. And then if you're managing this as a momentum list, I think the only ones you still would have left, I'm going to take these out tomorrow when I do my follow-up webinar, um, would be WIX, uh, JRJC, and NVAX. So these three would be left open. So I'm going to continue to follow these and see how far uh, they will go. But these are the exact stocks that I picked, okay? Now, this includes no money management, and it also shows you the high of the move. In the case of JRJC, NVAX, and Wix, I hope those keep on making new highs. So I hope these numbers become much, much bigger than they are. In the case of something like AERI, this thing has already done a 100% retrace. So without money management, this big gain would have resulted in a loss. The reason I'm showing you this was, Within a month, this stock that I picked went up about 50%. Well, if you follow the same methodology and rules that I follow, after a while, you should be able to pick stocks 
that looks like this, okay? Now this is, uh, that kind of dovetails into a, a soft sell here. The stock selection webinar, uh, I'm not gonna, I have now made those available and they're on a thumb drive. And you can go in and watch this webinar and you'll see me pick these stocks and I'll show you how and why I picked those. And you can see, you know, results not typical. It's not, it's not always this great, I'll tell you flat out. But as you can see, sometimes it's worth it, okay? <laughs> sometimes it can be worth it. So, and if you do that now, uh, six months free on the service. So see my website for more on that. Just click on Stock Selection Webinar here. So those have been made available. Uh, today. A couple of announcements before we jump out into the charts, and there's a lot of questions stacking up, so let me just rush through this real quick. Again, you want the webinar, go to my website. It's uh, six hours plus another eight hours, and there, I have three webinars left. If you want to be part of those three webinars, you can uh, certainly participate in those. Unlimited lifetime support, but it has to relate to the webinar, obviously. You can't call me up and say, I'm working on a trading system. I need some help developing the system. No, that's not what it's about. But if you say, hey, Dave, I like this stock at this level, at this price. This is why I like it. What do you think? I'll be happy to opine on that. Volume 2 of the Weekend Charts, if you like these shows, they are uh, available on my website. Check it out for that. My first two books are still relevant. See my website for more on that. Anyway, and then I think everybody here knows I have a trading service because we just talked about it for 30 minutes. We looked at the results um, in the spreadsheet of the current open portfolio. All right, now let's um, let me see if I get some of these uh, questions answered. Okay. Um, hey, Dave, four thousand shares of NG seems like way too many shares for me, especially for a hundred grand account. Am I risk averse? Well, you might be a little risk averse, and I hear you. Um, that's just how the money management works out. Now, one thing you're going to find with the money management. Uh, even at 2% is in your very lower priced stocks, especially if the stop, the STOP is not that wide, like a half a point, okay, just on a point basis, you're going to end up with a lot of shares of that particular stock, okay? So, yeah, that is a little risky, but that's the methodology that we're following, okay? And then hopefully enough of them work out to where if you do get whacked on one, let's say you get a 50% haircut in that stock overnight, then you could live to fight another day, okay? But yeah, I hear you on that, and it, 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 does, it does kind of add up quite a bit. But as long as you're, you're practicing proper money management, and of course you don't have that catastrophe, which could always happen, but as long as you don't have the catastrophe, then it, it'll work out with this money management. But I hear you. And some of my clients, I have some of my clients who have much bigger accounts, okay? Uh, they're blessed with big accounts. And they find, one sec. And, and they find that at 2%, I'm having a sneezing fit, sorry. They find at 2%, their positions get really, really, really huge where they're buying tens and thousands of shares, and it becomes too much. So that's just my general rule. That's what I follow um, on super small accounts. It doesn't work that great. On super big accounts, it doesn't work that great, okay? But in general, it's a good rule to follow. 2% risk if stopped out in each position. Especially read the second half of layman's if you know some discretionary techniques to help you when that inevitable big loss does come along. When you do get that, when you are on the wrong side of that outlier, that could always happen. Okay, so everything I say is not cast in stone. Take it and do what you think is right for you now. Be careful in that you don't want to say, well, I don't like this too much risk in this, so I'm only going to take a, a quarter of a percent position here, but I'm going to take a full 2% here and maybe a, uh, maybe a half a percent here. It's, it's, you know, be careful if you do that too much because you'll end up out of whack and you'll end up inconsistent in that you're going to have 
the biggest position is going to turn into a loser and your smallest position is going to turn into a big winner. Trust me, it happens. So when you do adjust down for that volatility uh, or whatever, uh, to adjust down to your comfort level or zone, just realize that you need to try to be consistent in your position sizing, sizing so you don't end up with too many shares of a big stinker and not enough shares of a big winner. So you want to be consistent. So 2% is the max you want to lose if stopped out. I don't want to lose, I don't lose anything, Jonathan. But yes, 2% is the max that I want to lose, so to speak, if stopped out. Absolutely. Okay. All right, we'll get to those stock picks in one second. Dave, you're more on than more off. That's why I'm here. I'm more on than more off. <laughs> I'm more on than more off. I think I get that. Once a bow tie is triggered, is it time to take the trade, or do we need to consider support resistance level, which has higher precedence? Okay. Uh, Jonathan's saying you get a bow tie, do you take it? No, because you might have some trouble with that particular stock, okay? So you got to think about it. So let's say I'm just, we'll just pick on them. This isn't the perfect bow tie. I think the other one's better. But yeah, let's say you got it. Let's just say this was a really good looking bow tie and you got your setup in here. You certainly want to look back here and see if you have a bunch of overhead supply and resistance, okay? Now, if this is way up here, excuse me, if that's where the that Mountain Dew is kicking in, So let's say, as I said earlier, that overhead supply is 100% away, then take the trade. You make 100% on a trade, you can be a happy camper, okay? All right, I'm going to go ahead and we'll jump into the charts, and um, I'm going to answer the remaining questions when we get to the... Um, Charts. What's your thoughts on following insider institutional filings, 13S, 4Ss? Uh, my thought is forget about it, okay? Forget about it. Don't worry about it. Like I said in my column a while back, if you are ocean racing in the Gulf of Mexico and it's dark, you want to stay away from the lit rigs. You don't want to run into them, okay? But if they're not lit, you don't have to worry about them, okay? Yeah, if you hit them, you're going to die. But you don't have to worry about them because there's nothing you could do about it, okay? So forget about all that news. And once again, the pressure's off. You don't have to worry about all those things. Uh, someone emailed me a couple of days ago and said um, they have some sort of news feed, and they get the news sometimes before. Um, not necessarily before anyone else, but they, they, they follow the, fi the the filings or whatever, and they claim that it, it that um, I mean they'll claim I'm sure it's actually helped them that they've gotten out of a few positions before they tank thanks to this news thing, and I don't doubt that. Okay, that's fine if you want to do that. Unfortunately, what's going to happen is it's a reaction to the news and not the news in and of itself. So if this gentleman and I don't want to pick on you because I think you're probably here today. But if you keep following that news feed thing, you're going to say, oh, that's some bad news on this XYZ. I better get out. And lo and behold, XYZ goes down a little bit on that bad news, but then turns around and goes straight back up. Now you have lost your winning position. Okay? I barely even know what RLYP does. And the only reason I, I knew it was a biotech, but the only reason I know a tiny bit about it, I was talking to a doctor friend of mine. He's on the service. Um, Tony, if you're out there, um, hey, man, uh, Dr. T. Anyway, the only reason I know a little bit about it is because we were just talking about it. It's like, well, what, we were just having a conversation, and we looked it up on, on Yahoo just to see what they do. For the most part, I have no idea what these companies do. I know what sector they're in, okay? Like, I know NG is a gold, and I know A and V is a gold, but I don't know a whole lot about either one of those companies. I don't know anything about those companies, in fact, okay? So the more antiseptic you could be, the more detached you could be, the better off you are going to be. If you start following the news, it's going to sway your opinion. It's going to knock you out of good positions, okay? So 
I ignore all the news. If you want to use news, knock yourself out. It's not my way or the highway. I'm telling you how I do it, and then you decide whether my way is right for you. Okay? <laughs> yeah, I got it. Okay. Let's get to the charts here. I want to take a look at the um, the overall market first. Uh, so, by the way, just because this happens to be on, somebody asked me if the stock is setting up again. This LIOX, which is in the portfolio, the answer is no. Uh, wait for it to break out decisively, and then look to play a pullback. Now, somebody played the pin in a few days ago. That's just not my style. Uh, but again, it's not my way or the highway. But yeah, wait for that to break out decisively, and then look to play the next pullback. Okay, let's take a look at the P's. Um, just so you know, I'm going to spend a few minutes on the, if you're new to these um, webinars. I want to spend a few minutes on the overall market, and then we'll uh, we'll take a look at your uh, stock picks. In fact, if you guys want to start talking about, uh, start asking about individual issues, you can do that now. All right, uh, let's take a look at the P's. And um, I'm still kind of bearish on the P's, but they don't seem to care. <laughs> You can see we obviously made that, that all-time high back on the 15th, and we were talking about that for much of this uh, webinar. And you had a bit of a kind of a micro first thrust down, and we got a nice little sell-off out of that. And we also had bow tie down from all-time highs, okay? And this could be a fairly powerful signal. Uh, but so far, the market is going straight back up. So I'm not as concerned about the bow ties just yet unless the market turns right back down. But I am concerned about the fact that the P's have made this V-shaped recovery at high levels. So all-time highs is your high level, drop like a stone, and then now it's making this V-shaped recovery. The problem is going to be it's going to be very hard for this market to make new highs and keep making new highs because it's going to be so overbought by the time it gets there. Now, stranger things have happened, okay? But right now, it's very dangerous to buy into this market. It does have a bit, to those of you who are familiar with the gatekeeper pattern, it has a bit of that gatekeeper look to it, except for the fact that it has um, uh, more days than I normally like to look for. Maybe look at a two-day chart. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Perfect. Uh, got about 11 days in the pattern. So it's a gatekeeper on a two-day chart. Uh, still have a bow tie down and a big retracement. Now, it's kind of... It's a little counterintuitive for a trend follower to say that this is a trend, it's, but so far it just looks like a big retracement in here. And the way I operate is, okay, my rules are this market has to start making new highs before I'm going to consider that trend resuming. I'm not going to try to bottom fish in here because I think it's turned right back up, okay? Now, if this thing makes a bottom like it did in 2009, and I start seeing bow ties coming off the lows and all those other sell signals that maybe I'll say, okay, we have a possible bottom. The other thing, too, and I'm not a huge fan of the pattern, but I guess we should kind of look at it. You do have a bit of a head and shoulder top, and your right side is higher than the left. Now, it still looks toppy to me in here. That doesn't mean I'm a rush out and sell the form. I only have one possible short on for today. Because we got one short that's not really working so well, and we got one short that's okay, doing pretty good for us, I should say. But I don't want to rush out and load the boat on the short side while the market is busy finding its way. But I will start taking things on a setup by setup basis. And we end up with a bunch of shorts, and we get knocked out along, so be it. Let that ebb and flow control your portfolio. Now, NASDAQ looks a little bit better, or a lot bit better, I should say, than the P's. Now, it's it has almost achieved that V-shaped recovery, but once again, like the P's, even if it does make it back to new highs, this new leg is going to be very tough to mount. I hate these V-shaped recoveries at high levels. Uh, give me just a just a, a trend-following moron type of market where it goes up, has a little pullback, goes up, has a little pullback, rinse, and repeat. Okay, let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty has been lagging in here, and it didn't quite make it back to those old highs. It's trying to make a bit of a witch hat in here. Let me show you that real quick. I said I would show you in the newsletter, so let me make sure I get that covered. 
A witch hat is when you have a pivot point, meaning, meaning a high surrounded by two lower highs. You have a sharp sell-off, and then you have a retrace back up to that prior pivot point. And if you connect the dots, it'll look like a witch's hat. In this particular case, this could be like an upside-down witch hat. Hopefully, you guys can see that. I can't invert the screen um, easily, okay? But I think it's still in trouble. And then if you put the moving averages in, you can see we still have a pretty serious bow tie uh, working down here. And then let's throw a 50-day moving average. We're looking at this. I was in a... Um, Invited into a webinar yesterday with Doug um, Newberry and Bill McKinley from uh, Trader Tools, and um, they they invite me in every now and then. And we were talking about this 50, and it's kind of what they call a throwback to the 50, or as I would say, it's going back to kiss the 50-day moving average behind. Uh, kiss, I'm sorry, going back to kiss the 50-day moving average goodbye. So notice you got a, a big sharp sell off below the 50. You got that sharp run up back to the 50 and this market still looks like it's in trouble now as I often preach when in doubt take the chart out so let's draw the let's draw the slide let's connect the dots okay here's your high and here's your low and here's your retrace okay so let's take the chart out so when in doubt take the chart out that looks like a market thrust down followed by a retrace that's still in a lot of trouble okay Speaking of which, take a look at some of these areas in here like manufacturing or more importantly, let me find you like health services, not so much health services, but health services, um, defense, manufacturing, um, all these areas in here, conglomerates that have sold off and then so far just kind of retraced up that are looking pretty rough in here. Banking is the one I really wanted to show you, okay? And you can see banking is, um, at least early on when I updated my charts, took, take a little spill today, too. So a lot of these areas, when you go through the sectors, I'm not going to bore you to go through all of them, but they've made these thrust downs followed by pullbacks, and I think they could still be in trouble. So pay careful attention to that. And then there were some sectors, there are some sectors that have come back in here like drugs and biotech have made it back to the new highs. I can't get too excited about buying them just yet as far as new positions. I'm enjoying the ride, believe me, in the RLYP and um, in, in the ride recently in ARI and some of those other ones. But I can't rush out and buy any new ones just yet because it is kind of a high-level recovery in here. It's not that V-shaped recovery like the overall market, or the P's at least, in the NASDAQ. But... I, I'm kind of in a show me mode here, and this is where I'm looking for that um, perfection in the overall market. Uh, most sectors not looking so good. Uh, few notwithstanding, like I said, have crawled back to their new highs. Uh, selected semis and semis overall, for that matter, have crawled back to the new highs. But again, notice you've got that V-shaped recovery at high levels, so that's going to be hard for that for that sector to, to sustain that. For the most part, I'm not seeing a whole lot of sectors that look that good. Gold, as I've been saying, and nauseam, I've been bullish on it for quite a while. Like I've been saying also, it's been more of a process than an event. You had this nice little bow tie off of these multi-year lows, and so far, so good, although it's taken its own sweet time to, uh, to get there. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and open it up for individual questions and individual stocks. Uh, Carol, no, LIOX is not set up again. We, we just covered that one, so it's going to have to keep um, keep on going. Okay. So John says, yes, yes, yes. Sold SSRI. Now, SSRI was, uh, was on my Landry list a while back, and that's a silver stock, if I can get it to come up, okay? And it worked out pretty nicely. So far, knock on wood. It's a little wide and loose and all over the all over the place. But, you know, again, you, sometimes you have to be a little bit more lenient with these silver stocks. And John is saying he sold it, and then he watched it go straight up without him. Okay? So you got to be careful not to micromanage yourself out of your positions. Again, it's going to be boring. Not completely boring, but less exciting. It's going to be less exciting when you start following your plan. But longer term, you do just fine. As I often preach, would you rather be right or make money? Okay? 
And for many, they'd rather be right. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but you would be surprised at how many people would rather be right than make money, okay? I would rather make money any day of the week, okay, <laughs> than be right. I have been watching NQ or at 100% retracement today. NQ, such as like the Qs, let's take a look at that. Yeah, you know, sure, that's 100% retracement. So, according to the Qs, this was just a correction in here, okay? My problem, again, though, is this V-shaped recovery at high level. But, hey, I'm a big fan of trend following, obviously, and I'm glad the Qs are back to new highs. I hope they keep on keeping on, okay? But right now, I'm still seeing quite a few shorts and not a whole lot of long, so I'm still kind of chipping away at it on the short side. But, yeah, if all the major agencies start hitting new highs, I might need to rethink that plan on the short side. Absolutely. John says, they're truly making me making money this year and breaking is, break it even, I guess, is 100% micromanaging, not following my plan and not using a little discretion. Absolutely. Okay, John, what do I always say? You know what you are doing wrong. So, here, I'm going to give you a little gift here. Stop doing that, okay? That's all you got to do. I know, easier said than done. But plan that trade and trade that plan. And it's going to be, you know, unless something really goes through the roof, it's going to be pretty boring for a while until something does go through the roof. And then you're going to feel pretty good about it. But you, you would have, by that time, you will have have learned to temper your expectations, okay, and, start, and stop trying to second-guess everything. Lewis wants to know about DDD. That's a, a printer company. Um, I've been bearish on this one for a while. It's, uh, it's crazy, though. It's a wild and crazy stock. We had the first thrust here. I'm sure it's a bow tie, too. We had the bow tie down. So your trigger would have been here. It's, it looks like it's poised to make a new leg down. My only problem now is you have a lot of support down here, so I don't think it's worth it as a trade. If you took the trade up at 80 bucks a share, then I think it's okay. But now I think it's too um, <laughs> too long. Looks at floor. Oh, John, uh, don't let me beat you up too bad. <laughs> Just don't do that. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you know, the, the, the case, it's, it's like almost retold the story again. It's like um, I told it last week, and, it, and I've probably told it 100 times before. My wife came to my office five years ago, six years ago. I forget when. It was a while back. might have been 10 years ago. I'm not too good with time. Um, she goes, what's going on? I said, well, I had a good problem to have. i got a lot of positions that are doing really well, but I'm not sure what to do. And she goes, well, what would Dave Landry do? And then she turned on her heel and walked out. You know, I'm like, ah, oh, shit, you know. She's right. You know, what would I do? Okay. So, and it forces me to do the right thing. And, and, and being a public image out there in the trading world, forces me to do the right thing, okay, especially anything I'm doing publicly, okay. What do you think of Twitter at 58? No. If I can get it to come up. No, no, it's got a, it, it's gapped down. You got a big, fat, ugly gap in here. Where is it now? Where is it months ago? Sideways at best. It's all over the place. Forget about Twitter, Okay. Yeah, it's a bad idea. What do you think about MUX? Never heard of it. Um, hmm. Interesting. Well, it's a mining company, and you may have gotten some kind of triggers in this already. But let's just, let's let's say you play like this little cup and handle here, which is probably off a bow tie or something. Then stay long. But for me to get excited about it, it would have to break out past these prior highs. And once it does that, you do have a lot of overhead supply. Again, like I said earlier, I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to overhead supply and problems with some of these issues that are commodity related. But I probably would not take the setup even if it broke out. If you're already long, then stay long. Sale. Okay. Blame it on my ADD, right? I think one person will get that. <laughs> 
Um, maybe on a pullback, but if it begins to pull back, it's going to be below this prior peak in here. So I don't know. I think I'd pass on that one. Maybe on a pullback. We'll see what happens then. Okay, EMMS. No. It's at 320. Where was it months ago? Am I, don't maybe whip out Nicholas. Dave, you know, NK after another day or so pullback. You know, NK. Uh, maybe. Maybe. You know, the, the only problem here is this stock is going straight up. So it's going to be a little dangerous to trade. So I, I put I put a maybe on that. Don, that's on my Landry list. Uh, that's actually a possible short, so I'm going to agree with you for once. Unfortunately, I can't show it to everyone. I was, Don had a good stock. Finally, has a good stock, but no, I can't show it. It's on my Landry list. Good, 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 good point. How about coffee, Joe? Joe's already made its move. Um, you know, as I said, if you're going to trade these efficient markets such as commodities and forex and things like that. Uh, which I do on occasion. Uh, I think you're better off just trading major trend transition. So a bow tie off of all-time lows like this uh, suggests a possible bottom. Um, maybe if it keeps on, and see now you're coming back to your old high. So maybe if it breaks, keeps on keeping on on pullbacks, it might be worth uh, trading that. Okay. How long do we have to wait to hear about Ford? All right, come on, here goes. Don's here, and what does he want to know about Ford? Uh, Ford looks like it's in a heap of trouble. Um, it's it's thrusted out and pulled back. I wouldn't rush out and short it because it's big, thick stock. It doesn't move around a tremendous amount. I think you can find some better shorts out there. I'd much rather short something like some of these insurance companies that are just sort of customer rolling over. But Ford, yes, does look like a possible short. Okay, we've got Ford out the way. <laughs> WPRT. Uh, maybe on a pullback, but here's the problem. This stock is way down here at these low, 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 low levels. Uh, you'd be much, I can't show you which one, but if you, I'll give you a little hint. If you dig through your auto parts stores, you're going to find one, not auto parts stores, but auto part manufacturers. You're going to find one that's at very high levels like this, and it's just on the cusp of breaking down. So a little hint, hint on that one. I'd much rather be in that one then in this one, which has already made its move lower as a possible short, okay? So hint, hint on that. GBX for Steve. That's going to be uh, a railroad company maybe. Um, well, it's already made its move back to its old high. See, it broke out. It retraced all the way back. I'd leave it alone because it doesn't really have any structure anymore. Unless it broke out to new highs and it came back. Hymax is going sideways, Don. Okay. Draw your lines. Draw your arrows on that. If you're long, stay long. Absolutely. Oh, I, I see a good question, Steve. Is it safe to say you're more lenient with prior resistance when a major bow tie has occurred, i.e. in the metals? And as a quick, short answer, the answer is yes. So Steve say, let's say you get a major bow tie, meaning that you get a bow tie coming off all-time lows. Am I going to be a little bit more lenient? Uh, the answer is yes, possibly, because I know a major bottom in place. I mean, look right here, 2012. Uh, on Hymax, I remember was making that bow tie back there. Uh, you you might be a little bit more lenient here because you got a major major buy signal. Absolutely. You guys are getting very smart. Uh, just got your book, Layman's Guide. Thank you, Austin. Appreciate that. Uh, good book. Thank you. Hey, put that up on uh, <laughs> Amazon, will you? Do you recommend a subscribe TC2000 as a new day trader? Or stick with IB charts. I don't know what IB charts uh, do, but as far as following my methodology, not as a day trader though, as a position trader, uh, I would highly recommend you get uh, TC. Um, uh, check my affiliate code is AF136. Tell them that I sent you there. I don't know where they are with their affiliates right now. They seem to be uh, in between affiliates, but for what it's worth. Short KRE? Yes, absolutely, Calvin. Let's take a look at that. That's going to be like a banking ETF. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's Kroger? No, no, KRE. KRE. Short Kroger, too. Shoot. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, good, good. You know what? You get a high five. Calvin gets a high five, and I'm not just giving him that because he's on my service, but uh, absolutely. Man, an all-time high, uh, falls out of bed, nice little pullback. That looks fantastic. High five. 
I'm allowing you and G how to manage that position. You tell me. What is your plan? Did you have a plan going in? If you didn't have a plan going in, then you shouldn't be trading. How's that? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Give it some room, I guess, at this point. But tell me what your initial plan was. If we have time, we'll look at it. Okay? But you know what? From now on, see, I just beat you up a little bit. And I'm sorry. I apologize. But you're going to take tomorrow, the next day, the day after, before you take that trade, hopefully I piss you off enough to where you can be like, you know, maybe Dave's right. Maybe I should have a plan going in. Okay? P-S-I-X. I have never heard of that. P-S-I-X. Power. So, oh, it's too thin. Yeah, be careful with that. It looks like it's in trouble, though. You got a bow tie down from all-time highs, or it looks like multi-year highs. Yeah, be careful with that one. Um, but, yeah, it looks like it's in a lot of trouble. Super duper 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 thin. Dangerous. Uh, Miss Carol wants to know about CSIQ. That's going to be a solar stock. Um, if you're long, stay long. It's not really set up at this juncture. You've got too many days of the pullback here, but definitely stay long if you are long like I think you might be. Um, but on the next breakout, I mean, I'm guessing that you might be. Uh, on the next breakout, uh, wait for the next pullback and then go after that, okay? You feel lucky, punk? <laughs> CDTI for John. CDTI. Uh, well, it's too many days in the pullback here. This is a wild and crazy one. Look at your HV. It's 116. I mean, I hear you. If you back the chart way out, it looks like it's bottomed out and beginning to rally. It's also in this uh, alternate energy sector. But it's just a little too wild and crazy and too dangerous. It went up 100% in, a, in, in less than a week. So I would leave it alone, but if it does break out the new highs and starts pulling back and trading cleanly, then I'd put it as a possibility. ARI, I'm not going to like because it's come all the way back in. ARI, AR, area? Are you serious? Did you really ask about that? That's a Don stock. No. No, yes. Did you ask about that last week? Is that why I had this big gap in here? This big X? What are we going to do with him? APO. <laughs> Apple's at a big gap down, and now it's going back up. I'd leave it alone. Um, it still looks toppy to me, but I would leave it alone. It's all over the place. Long GMO. Let's take a look at that. Okay, we're going to have to go quick now and lighten around. No, not yet. Uh, this is those uh, one of those um, rare stocks. I was bullish on these a while back, but they didn't really pan out. Um, and the problem with this one, I know it's, it's also a penny stock, but uh, notice the amount of overhead supply it has, and it's not really set up. So it would have to get through this overhead supply for me to get excited about that. Amazon is a short. Yeah, Amazon looks okay as a short, but it's a big, thick stock, okay? You got your bow tie down. You got your reversal gap strategy. I think I would leave it alone, but, yes, it looks like it's in trouble. Uh, you certainly want to look at something like Amazon. You're doing your nightly analysis and say, hey, Amazon's in trouble, and just – just either make a note of that or put it in the back of your mind, and that helps to confirm whether or not the overall market is in trouble. When you start seeing some of these high flyers like this begin to implode. Uh, long or short, absolutely a short, but I think you might be able to find something better out there. But, yeah, Amazon's been coming up in uh, my scans and in my uh, going through a lot of stocks as possible. Uh, long, U or G, that's going to be a uranium stock, U or G. We are long U or A. Just FYI, um, it would have to break out above 150. You got a, you got some bad memories here, but that's that's three or four years ago. Um, but at this particular point in time, it would have to break out above 150 before we get excited about it. Okay, MCP. That's another one of those. Uh, that's molybdenum. I hope I said that right. It's kind of hard to say. Stocks. Uh, yeah, I was bullish on these a while back, but they just, they're just all over the place. And look at the overhead supply uh, in here. So it's going to have to get above 8 before I think about it. All right, Steve, have a good weekend, too. All right, a couple more. We're going to have to shut it down. Um, let me see. I'll try to get somebody I hadn't got to. It's probably a reach, but uh, Tuesday took a small position in soda. Soda. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's you know, you've got a big gap down. Draw your arrow. You know, you definitely don't want to be buying a stock. This is what I was trying to teach you. The student yesterday in the stock competition, you know, his teacher said to buy low and sell high. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't want to do that, okay? You want to buy high and sell higher. You're welcome, Carol. 
All right, uh, one more, and we'll have to wrap it up. Uh, how about you, Scott? MGH too volatile to get in after a major pullback yesterday. MGH. Uh, yeah, probably. Well, I don't know. Let's back the chart out and see. Um, the problem with this stock is it's a little bit on the thin side, and obviously it's a penny stock. So if you multiply the volume times the price, it's a pretty thin stock. Um, yeah, it's also kind of a bottle rocket. It went from 15 cents to 60 cents. That's like a 300, 400% move. Uh, it's just too dangerous to trade. Uh, you know, maybe on a flyer, but just realize it would it would be just too volatile, too dangerous to trade. I hear you though. It looks like it bottomed out. It it thrust up. It pulled back. But I'd be super careful with that. Well, look, we're out of time here. Uh, anything I'd answer, just shoot me an email, daviddavelander.com, and like I said, I'll either get to it right away or um, I'll get to it uh, first chance. Um, yeah, we're long URZ, sorry. Not, URA is the, the ETF. Uh, or we'll use it as fodder for next week. Uh, if we don't talk to you now in the weekend, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thank you guys so much. I have a blast doing these shows, and, and I'm just humbled that you guys show up uh, to listen to me. So thank you so much. Everybody enjoy your weekend, and uh, we'll, I'll see you guys uh, next week, if not sooner. Thank you.